Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, the 2014 sequel with some of the best effects, best Spider-Man suit design, and uh, plot with such a death wish for Gwen Stacy that it reads like the mind of a deranged murderer. Gonna kill ya. Just kidding. Gonna kill ya. Just kidding. Gonna kill ya. Just kidding. Actually, never mind, you're dead. And yes, there are two separate psycho research walls in this movie. One of them randomly scored that song for you. For you, movies never get enough of this song that f sucks. There's been a lot of hate on this movie over the years, but trust me, it is still worth revisiting. You asked for this, and I found a ton of fascinating visual details in it. Easter eggs, plans for what insanity might have been. Some of these details might make you appreciate it more. Others might make you say, wow, there was even more of a method to this madness than I realized, and I'm glad we got off this secret train powered by arcade tokens. The film opens inside a clock. The cogs and gears of Richard Parker's wristwatch foreshadowing the machinations of the clock tower that sealed the fate of Gwen Stacy, the character whose death these two movies obsessively thwip toward. Like its predecessor, this movie deepens the conspiracy of Peter's father and Oscorp, revisiting the night of the previous film's prologue. Fittingly, the Parker's plane's descent transitions into the plunge of Peter's spider logo as he swings down to stop crazy Paul Giamatti. <laughs> He's the Spidey villain, the Rhino, evidenced by the rhinos on his boxers. And rather than immediately stopping his deadly plutonium truck theft when he could, Peter shit talks and gives Rhino time to murder more drivers and pedestrians in that alley. You can pinpoint the second they'll never be able to walk again, so, you know, Peter can get a few more laughs for his reel. Peter's ringtone is the 60s animated Spider Man theme. because he's you know, somehow aware of his own franchise, and he misses Gwen's death foreshadowing graduation speech. I know we all think that we're immortal. We're supposed to feel that way. <laughs> yeah, right. And Stan Lee cameos. I think I know that guy. Peter keeps hallucinating Dennis Leary everywhere after he warned Peter at the end of the last film. Leave Gwen. And so, they break up, and Peter's now single and ready to Peter single. The nerd he deprives of a character-building life experience never learns to appreciate pain and thus stupidly walks directly into gunfire in the final scene. And Peter glues the kid's project with webbing that will dissolve a few hours later. He failed this child. A.D. Bryant cameos as the Statue of Liberty, and then Peter catches his police truck and exits frame right. Which I kind of love this, it's an homage to Buster Keaton's move in the movie Cops. Max Dillon, future Electro, celebrates his own birthday with a cake with green and yellow frosting and lightning bolt shapes. Of course, a nod to Electro's color scheme. And you might not have noticed how the background of this apartment also reflects these colors. The green window and the yellow lampshade. Peter mentioned selling photos of the Daily Bugle. Yeah, it would really help if that guy would pay you a fair wage. Well, James, no, James and Pace paid me a fair wage if it was 1961. You paid me a fair wage. He says 1961, which is the year right before Spider-Man debuted in the comics in 1962. Now, Jameson himself does not appear in the film, but the Daily Bugle does a few times. Dylan's boss is BJ Novak as Alistar Smythe, who in the comics is a villain who controls the Spider Slayer robot assassins. Harry Osborn meets his alien father, Norman, dying from a family curse, and when he dies, a green light scans his body, and then a medical worker rolls in a cryo container? That is because there was a scrapped plan for the third movie in the series to preserve Norman's head and for him to regenerate along with Gwen and her father using Peter's blood serum. Possibly in three, there was this idea at one point that uh, Spider-Man would be able to take this formula and regenerate the people in his life that had died. Captain Stacy would come back even bigger in oh, wow. episode three, and I was like, Let's go. And I think I need to see that now. Chris Cooper's head rattling around in an ice cooler. Avenge me, boy. And uh, open this white claw for me because I can't get my teeth around it. Peter emails photos to J. Jonah Jameson. Past emails from Jameson call his photos crap and offering only 10 bucks for the whole set. Another email from Aunt May reminds him to pick up eggs. A call back to him forgetting and later remembering the eggs in the previous film. And an email from Oscorp HR suggesting Peter has been applying for jobs there to no avail. Probably because we don't want our former employee's son investigating all the shit we did to him. Max falls in the eel tank and somehow the electricity fixes the gap in his teeth. Which I love because Jamie Foxx didn't need the gap in his teeth to begin with. They just gave it to him so that these eels could fix it in this moment. Happy birthday! In Harry's boardroom is Felicity Jones as... Felicia. 
she was being set up as Felicia Hardy, Black Cat. But it didn't pan out, of course, so she moved on to Star Wars stories and immediately killed her off. Bye, Felicia. Peter and Harry catch up, which Peter hates so much he casually tries to kill himself, and they skip those stones, which Peter aces because, you know, he's Spider-Man, but Harry kerplunks like an idiot. But you can see it's because his hands have already begun twitching, which his father warned him about. Has your hand started to twitch yet? Electro attacks Times Square, and notice how spectator barriers have been set up? Which, you know, I, I hate to be nitpicky because, you know, all movies can do this. But this would imply preparation for onlookers. We actually see this again in the final scene. Cops, why would you set up anything for people to stand there and watch? Don't erect a f barrier. People need to keep running for blocks and not turn around. They're going to die. That's definitely not a safe radius for all the bullets and lightning that are flying around. And similarly, when Electro attacks those red steps, the people there are fleeing up those steps, despite the fact that there is nowhere for them to go at the top. These stairs don't lead anywhere. And you know these people know this because later they know to flee down those steps. See, the sequence was not designed to be a true threat. Really, it is no deeper than a mere visual spectacle, a light show with a literal stage and a literal audience. And that superficial aspect, seeing the screen switch from Electro to Spider-Man, is what turns Max on Peter in this moment. Peter's research on what Roosevelt refers to brings up a photo of the Roosevelt Island tramway, a nod to the final battle with the Green Goblin in the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man film. And I know I already bashed the psycho research wall, but God damn it, Peter went to the effort of printing out FDR's face on separate post-it note size squares and then piecing them back together. I guess because FDR's big checkerboard face is the key to this movie? <laughs> She's the key! But before I continue, thank you to Bang Energy for sponsoring this video. Every can of Bang is 16 ounces. It contains 300 milligrams of caffeine. It's sugar-free, has zero calories, yet it tastes great. With over 20 different flavors to choose from, one of those great flavors is Rosé Rosé. It has that great fruity taste of rosé wine, but will make you come back to life as if you were a fictional immortal. Still capable of dying, but really nothing can keep you down. Check out Bang on Instagram. You can get 25% off your order at bang-energy.com when you use the code NEWROCKSTARS25. There you can buy cans of Bang Energy, including their sweet tea and keto coffee flavors. You can also get clothing, fitness supplements, all kinds of stuff to be your best Bang self. Thanks again to Bang Energy for sponsoring this video. Get 25% off at bang-energy.com using the code NEWROCKSTARS25. Harry Osborn similarly unlocks a trinket to his daddy's secrets. Oscorp secret projects that include, if you look closely, Dr. Connor's file and Dr. Morbius file, which refer to Dr. Connors from the previous film, and Michael Morbius, the living vampire, coming soon next year with Hunka Hunka Jared Leto. There's also Venom storage and Experiment Oct. 32A, which could be nods to Venom and Dr. Octopus. And there's also a bunch of projects in Australia, Oahu, New Zealand, Manchester. Those could refer plans to introduce international bounty hunter, Craven Hunter. Actually, there's that saber tooth tiger skull with the gold teeth in its room. Could be another bounty or trophy that Craven gave to Norman in the past. And in the archive video of Richard Parker and Norman Osborn, you can already see Norman's hand starting to twitch there too, a sign of his illness starting to set in. The YouTube video Peter researches has zero downvotes, yet the blue bar should put that like rate somewhere in the low 80s. I know this because that bar is my master. Harry tells Peter he needs Spider-Man's blood for its self-healing properties. He can do everything else a spider can. Another sort of nod to that animated theme song, does whatever a spider can. Now the first moment Gwen meets Harry, it's a jump scare for her. Gwen Stacy. Oh my god. Sorry. Yeah, Gwen is right to be afraid. This is the psycho that will later snatch her up out of nowhere and lead to her death which will be a much faster drop than the descent in their elevator here. The Ravencroft Institute is a key supervillain prison in the Marvel comics, a prison for supervillains in the criminally insane. It is run by Dr. Ashley Kafka, as it is in the comics, and he plays Johann Strauss's Beautiful Blue Danube, most famously used to evoke humanity's great leaps forward into sci-fi in films like 2001 A Space Odyssey, and recently with another blue freak lab experiment, Dr. Manhattan in Watchmen. Spider-Man refuses to give Harry his blood. <laughs> You're a fraud, Spider-Man! And Peter does some national treasure shit, finds his daddy's secret train lab, and learns it was Richard's own DNA infused with the spiders, making it Peter's destiny to become Spider-Man. People will say I'm a monster for what I've done. 
maybe they're right. Uh -huh. The real crime against nature here was going back to the sacred bloodline trope instead of the this could have happened to anybody factor that has always made Spider-Man great. Meanwhile, Harry manages to overpower two armed guards and free Electro and then uses Megan to access Norman's basement, which is cast in green light for the, you know, the, the, the color of the, the goblin. You get it. Now, in this basement are six chambers, Sinister Six, among which you can see Doc Ock arms. And later, with Gustav Fears, you can see vulture wings and a rhino exoskeleton. The end credits show flashes of all of these Sinister Six figures, along with nods to Craven the Hunter and maybe Chameleon for a planned Drew Goddard directed Sinister Six film that was scrapped. And as Harry transforms, we get this nice, sweaty, veiny shoulder blade roll. And let's loop that for some puke porn, please. <laughs> As Peter chases Electro around the city, I love this, he climbs up his own web during the swing. Now again, the effects and action in this movie, pretty solid. But uh, unfortunately, for some parts of this battle, we don't really want to see it. Like, you know, when Electro pukes lightning on him. You ready to give up? And of course, infamously, when he turned the power plant grid columns into a xylophone. Which I gotta say, like those crowd barriers, is mostly weird just because it implies illogical preparation. Like for this to work, Electro would have had to come here hours earlier and slam himself against these, tuning them so that he could later play a nursery rhyme song. Like he must have had a friend to help him. Not, not quite my temple. But Gwen arrives to help, and on this day, she is wearing a green jacket and a purple skirt, the exact same clothes that she wears during her famous death in the comics. But her death is uh, not much of a surprise. It's telegraphed pretty overtly. Nobody makes my decisions for me, all right? Nobody. This is my choice. Hmm, it's interesting how Gwen's face was off screen for the line, this is my choice. Almost as if Emma Stone had to come back in to redub the audio in an attempt by the filmmakers to soften the blow of her death and make it make a bit more sense. But the damage has already been done. Because in this movie, Gwen's death is just a factor of a totally unmotivated conflict between Peter, Harry, and Electro. It really just happens because the script and the studio said it has to, which is really the core issue for both of these movies. See, really the curses of Peter Parker's life are all meant to come from chaos and randomness. But this series tries to streamline that mythology. His powers, the death of Uncle Ben, Gwen Stacy's death, they all play out like predestined clockwork. We actually see the gears moving both metaphorically and literally in the opening images. But sadly, it cheapens Gwen's death by just making her feel like another cog in that machine. Now, yes, it's kind of cool that the clock tower freezes on 121, the issue number Gwen died in the comics, but the camera work doesn't really do anything to make it subtle or like discoverable. The clock hand just clangs with a duh. Kind of like they started with this idea and then worked their way backwards from it and then never really wanted the audience to see other possible futures. Now, some accuse Peter of not mourning Gwen long enough in the final minutes of this movie, but actually we do see him at her grave for a full year's worth of seasons passing around him. Really, the bigger issue is how Peter returns to being Spider-Man unchanged from the first act. He's even fighting the same villain. The one new move he pulls is using a manhole lid to deflect Rhino's projectiles and smack him with it, which you could say is a callback to him using the lid against Electro in the power plant. But even that move technically was before Gwen arrived to change his whole attack strategy and teach him a thing or two. It's almost as if the studio is saying, look, you get more, you Spider-Man. Man, are you happy, nerds? Really, the best lesson the studio learned from this was simply to surrender the character to another studio that knows what they're doing when it comes to fan service. Now, does this mean Sony is incapable of good Spider-Man stories? Absolutely not. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is considered by many to be the best Spider-Man movie, and that was all Sony. At the end of the day, I am grateful for these two amazing Spider-Man films. There's a lot to love in both. Historically, I just find it uncanny that this came out the same year as my two favorite MCU films, Captain America The Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy, because this proves to superhero filmmakers that even in this modern era, success in this genre is not a given. But for my hotter takes on these movies and to join us for our next watch along, join our official Discord server by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. Follow me on Instagram at EA Boss, follow new rock stars on socials, and subscribe for breakdowns of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs>